Hello, and welcome to Wednesday at Bear Branch, a virtual ministry of the Churches of Christ. We are now rebroadcasting the study of the fourfold gospel compiled by Brother J. W. McGarvey, taught by Brother Brian Barrett, who preaches for our congregation here at Bear Branch in Spurlockville, West Virginia. We hope that you will find the lessons profitable in the study of God's Word and enlightening to the Christian walk. Brother Barrett has been a preacher and teacher in the Churches of Christ for over 40 years, a frequent speaker in gospel meetings, revivals, having worked in TV and radio, and now our internet ministry. You may obtain a copy of Brother J. W. McGarvey's The Fourfold Gospel at our website, www.thechurchesofchrist.life. On our Fourfold Gospel page, you may use either the online copy or download the volume from this site, both are free to use. We now invite you to open your Bibles and the fourfold gospel. Follow along in our lesson of the hour. Now, here's Brian. Let me pick up and we're going to pick up where we left off last week in the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. The section of scriptures that we were looking at were in Mark 3 or Matthew 3. 1 through 12, Mark 1, 1 through 8, and Luke 3, 1 through 18. As we left off last week, uh, we were talking about the questions that were asked of John and what they should do, those who were coming to his baptism, and he spoke to them about some of the expectations uh, that he uh, had for them to, as, as a sign of repentance and also uh, that God had given to him. The Spirit called John into his uh, work, told him you know, to be content with their wages and not to extort uh, more than was due to the tax collectors. Tonight we're going to be in verse 15. Uh, and it says, And as the people were in expectation, and all men reasoned in their hearts concerning John, whether happily he were the Christ. With his coming and his preaching and his calling people to repentance, it is easy to see why some may have believed that he was the Christ. We're told that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, the prophet. And so uh, people began to wonder among themselves whether or not he would be the Christ. Those who understood uh, anything about Daniel's prophecy and the, the prophecy of weeks knew that uh, they were quickly running out of time for uh, the Messiah to come. Those who might be plotting and planning and following knew that it was time for the Messiah to show up. And so John shows up preaching and teaching to <laughs> repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that means that the Messiah and the king of the kingdom must be somewhere. And they begin to contemplate whether that would be John. Of course, we've mentioned this before, but John is of the tri tribe of Levi, uh, though he is a priest, he is not part of the tribe uh, of Judah, and therefore would not be uh, the fulfillment of that. But uh, at that time, uh, there was a king appointed by Rome and governors appointed by Rome, and it had been a while uh, since there was a literal descendant of David uh, really reigning, and so uh, maybe they begin to consider, well, you know, maybe it'll change a little bit. But, uh, of course, uh, they, they were uh, turning their hearts towards John, especially, I think, when, you know, one of the things that we see is that the, when the people saw somebody uh, beginning to address the Pharisees, and the Sadducees for much of the hypocrisy and many of the things which uh, we talk about a lot, 
Uh, when someone took a stand for the people, it was easy to see why you would want to root for him uh, because the average person uh, understood, they felt as if they were being used and abused uh, and uh, misused uh, along the way. And so they began to question whether or not uh, he indeed would be the Christ. And as they questioned among themselves, we're told in verse 16, John answered, saying unto them, and he preached, saying, I indeed baptize, baptized you in or with water unto repentance, but there he that cometh after me, he that is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, uh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. As we have looked in some of our studies in Sunday morning, especially with the book of John, uh, we have already been talking about in the first part of that study uh, a lot of John's discussion with the people uh, but this is one of those uh, passages or a combination of the passages that, that covers both uh, some of the statements in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you'll see notations if you're following along in the book. You'll see the A's, B's, and C's that are there that shows you the different readings in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And also uh, some there also... Uh, that, that comes uh, later uh, from John as we get in a little further. But a couple different things that he talks about. You know, he, he said, was baptizing them in or with water. Uh, his baptism was a baptism of immersion based upon them confessing their sins and being told that they should believe on him that would come after. And he further says that this baptism that uh, would come through the Messiah uh, would be more than that. He would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so uh, we have water, we have Spirit, we have fire. John says, I'm just baptizing with water and I'm telling you uh, to believe on him uh, that should come after. And of course, uh, we know that Jesus on the day of Pentecost, uh, God sent forth the Holy Spirit uh, upon the apostles and those to whom the apostles laid their hands and also upon the Gentiles, the household of Cornelius, to show the acceptance of both the Jews and the Gentiles into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus uh, in John 3, speaking with Nicodemus, of course, speaks about the fact that one must be born of water and of spirit. And throughout the New Testament, we can see there is mentioned in various passages and ways how it is that uh, Paul's writing to Titus and Titus 3 talks about the washing of water and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, how the two of those work together. Uh, in the book of Colossians, the second chapter, we find there, having faith in the operation of God, we are buried with Christ in that watery grave of baptism having faith in the operation of, of God, and we could go into a lot of that, but uh, it, is, it is indeed difference between the, the, a major difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Christ or the Christ or the anointed one. And this was a big uh, question uh, about uh, that Paul came there in Acts 19 to Ephesus and he found certain disciples there and he met with them and he could tell something wasn't quite, quite right. 
And so he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit since they believed. And they said they had not so much heard whether there be a Holy Spirit, uh, and that no one had, had contacted them. And he asked them, into what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. And so uh, there is a distinction made between uh, the baptism of John, the baptism of Christ there in Acts 19 at Ephesus. And John makes a distinction about the baptism. His baptism was one in preparation of the coming of the Messiah. Why people today would still uh, be trying to follow John the Baptist instead of following Jesus Christ, I have no idea. But they do. I've heard people continually uh, continue to say, you know, I'm a disciple of John the Baptist. Thank you. John the Baptist did not die for you on the cross of Calvary. John the Baptist uh, did not uh, send forth the Holy Spirit. And uh, John the Baptist didn't uh, do many things. John uh, was a great preacher and teacher, and he called people to repentance, but he died and he didn't resurrect. He didn't come back on the third day. Uh, his, his spirit, his soul went into the Hadean realm and there he stayed. His body saw corruption, uh, but Jesus is different. And so John here speaks about the fact that the one who comes after me, uh, he is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. That's uh, one of the things coming from Matthew, Matthew's account, Matthew 3, shoes I'm not worthy to bear. Uh, and then Mark says the latchet or the shoelaces of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down <laughs> and unloose. And then we have John's statement, he shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And so as we uh, look at, at all of this, uh, we've, we've mentioned it, but I'll mention it again. What John is describing as far as dealing with the shoes, not worthy to bear them or carry them. Other uh, writers say, you know, he, he was talking about not worthy of, of loosening the shoe strings. This uh, was the job of the servant. He talks about stooping down and unloosening the shoe strings or the, the, to uh, lash uh, the, the laces. And as one came into uh, the house, if there were servants there, the servant would come and, and help you to unlatch, in essence, untie the the laces on your shoes provide water and various ointments and things. And so John is portraying himself as one who is not really even worthy of being his servant. It's a, it's a very powerful position. I don't know, uh, or powerful statement that he makes. And I don't really know, I guess, again, shallow theology. People don't really think their way through this, but... You know, the servant was worthy to bring the water and untie the shoelaces and lay their shoes off to the side and, and to put their shoes back on and lace them back up. And John says, I'm not even worthy to unlatch, you know, his shoes. I'm not even worthy to be his servant. So he made himself less than, uh, he describes himself as being less than the servant of Christ. So why would you want a church based on John the Baptist? Why would you want to follow John the Baptist instead of Christ and the New Testament church, which he has established? And if anybody really takes the time to read and listen to what John says, you know, they wouldn't want to. We appreciate John the Baptist. We appreciate the work that he did. God chose him just like he chose Mary and he chose Joseph to be the, the parents of Jesus and to raise Christ. And John was one who he chose uh, to be the forerunner and prepare the way. And I think he did a wonderful job. 
uh, of preparing the way for Christ because when we see Christ beginning to preach and teach, multitudes begin to follow him and they begin to see him teaching with authority as uh, we've talked about. Any, anything down through the part about baptizing them with the Holy Spirit? And of course, then he speaks about baptism also uh, of fire. Uh, and so a lot of people think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire is the same thing because on the day of Pentecost, there were cloven tongues of fire that appeared uh, upon the apostles. But, uh, you know, that was a sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the real baptism of fire, as it is described here, uh, literally is the burning of the chaff and the waste and separating it away from uh, the, the good, the faithful uh, seed. And so we're not really talking about the same thing when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. The Holy Spirit signifies the coming of the church, the coming uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, things started there on the day of Pentecost, but the baptism of fire will be the thing that that takes all of this out. You know, we're told that the heavens that are now exist, the earth that's here, the works that are therein will be burned up, Peter says, and we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And he describes that. Uh, he talks about uh, in the verses here, <clears throat> his fan is in his hand, uh, that which they use to help separate the chaff. We talked about last week, sometimes they would um, take either, a, to me, it's a shallow basket, but it could be seen as a big fan, uh, not an electric fan, but like the hand fan, something that could scoop up a considerable amount of the, the wheat and, and throw it up in the ground, up in the air, and the chaff would be blown away, and then they would gather the wheat and of course, once the, the chaff was separated and blew out, raked up and, and burned. And so it talks about the fact that, uh, you know, he will cleanse his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into his uh, barn, in essence, and a garner. Uh, the garners or uh, uh, the granaries. Uh, and so when we hear about the, the garner or the granaries, that's what we're talking about. The garneries or granaries, the places, the vaults that they stored this in. Sometimes in the scriptures, it's talked about building, tearing down your barns and building bigger barns. There's, there's various terms that uh, are used in different areas were used, different things were used to store the wheat in, something that would protect it uh, both from the heat and the cold and the dampness as well as, uh, you know, a, a storing place. And he speaks there about burning up the chaff, and it says he will burn up this chaff with unquenchable fire. And one of the references that uh, Brother McGarvey gives this is the a reference in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9, and that God will come, Jesus will come, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, these who will uh, be destroyed with an everlasting destruction from the presence of God, from the glory of His power. They're not just going to be punished for a little while and then sent up to heaven. They're going to be punished with an everlasting destruction. In Matthew 25, speaking about the same thing, uh, talking about the unrighteous, you know, will we'll go into everlasting punishment, which is prepared for the devil and his angels, but the righteous will enter into the, to the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. 
And so uh, we, we get an idea of the fact that John the Baptist was truly a fire and brimstone preacher. You know, he was, he was warning them to flee from the wrath which is to come. When he was speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when he was calling them a generation of vipers or children of, of vipers, he was talking about that wrath which is to come, that baptism of, of fire. And in order to prepare for that, to flee, one needed to repent uh, and to believe the, the good news of the gospel first began to be taught by John, saying the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus will begin saying the kingdom of heaven is as at hand or is near. And of course, then the apostles will, will come preaching and teaching that the kingdom is here. It has arrived, and Peter will speak about that in uh, Acts, the second chapter. And so as this uh, section here closes up, it says, with many other exhortations uh, therefore preached he good tidings unto the people and so over the years a lot of people have, have asked questions you know what what type of things was was John teaching and of course we've already seen a little bit here some of the things about you know the tax collectors don't exhort more than what is due you can be content with your wages that's a tough one isn't it you know, that's, that's a hard pill for many people to swallow, uh, you know, is, is, you know, we like to strike and we, we want to unionize and we want to, but, uh, you know, Jesus taught us a parable, you know, he, he contracted for a penny that you agreed to work for the penny, you got a penny, what's your problem? And so be content with the things that uh, you have. And so uh, it's clear that John was encouraging the people to live moral lives because he was encouraging them to repent of their sins. And you can take the, uh, the, the Ten Commandment law, which John was still obligated to, and you can look at all the various aspects of that. And there were many who had fallen short of many of the things that were written there in those Ten Commandments, especially how they related to loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, loving your neighbor as yourself, not violating many of, of these commands. And so he was there to turn the hearts of the people back to the fathers, to turn the hearts of the, the children, the descendants of the Jews back to those who were brought out of Egyptian bondage, those who received the law. Seems a little strange, but you know they needed to repent and you can't put them in the church until there's a church. So the first step is renewing, in essence, their relationship with God under the covenant that they had. They weren't keeping the covenant that they had so why would we expect him to keep the covenant he was about to give? And so the coming of John the Baptist and part of that preparation was getting the people to honor the covenant that God had made with them at Sinai. And he again renewed that before they went into the promised land. And they continued that as Nehemiah repeated the law to the children of Israel when they came out of Babylonian captivity. And so... They needed to uh, you know, be faithful to that schoolmaster that Paul speaks of in, in Galatians 3. And if they weren't going to be faithful to them, it was going to be difficult to be faithful uh, to Christ. And we see a lot of, of the struggles that take place in the early church, even with having the ministry of John the Baptist there. Any questions or comments? Y'all quiet tonight. We're going to, uh, if there's nothing else, we're going to then go into part three of the textbook. And this, we've looked at the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. Now we're going to be looking at the beginning of our Lord's ministry. And of course, 
the ministry of Jesus and John the Baptist uh, overlapped for a period of time. In this particular section, it's numbered in the workbook after the heading of section three, or part three, division three, we're then down into the subsection number 18, XVII, -I, as it's spelled out in the textbook. And in these particular passages, we're looking at Mark 3, 13 through 17, or Matthew 3, 13 to 17, Mark 1, 9 through 11, and Luke 3, 21 through 23. And we're looking at specifically here the beginning, the baptism of Jesus by John in the Jordan River, the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan was east of Jericho. And this would have been, according to the timeline we've been working on, around the spring of A.D. 27. So the timeline that, that we're looking at, which is, I suppose, we might call the corrected timeline, uh, if we're going to the timeline that many times we think of, I, I hate to be confusing, but the timeline that most of us think of, this would probably be about A.D. 30. If we're talking about the actual, you know, if Jesus was born in AD 1 and he started about AD 30, at the age of 30, that would be the, the time frame we're looking at. But in the way that that adjusts, when we correct that, we're back to about 27. So we're, uh, we're back in, in their way of, of keeping track of of time about 27. So this is why, you know, it's it's difficult. You know, we speak in a general sense, and I'll just put this in here. We speak of a general sense of the church was established in AD uh, 33. And that's based on the fact that from the, the time Jesus was really born, not this other time frame we're looking at here, but if we go from the time that he was really born to the time he started his ministry, it would be 30. And three and three and a half years would be A.D. 33. And so that's where we get that. And it's going to be a little bit different from what Brother McGarvey gives because, you know, I, I guess we would say A.D. 1 began in B.C. 6. You've got to put the timelines back that way, somewhere thereabouts. So with that being said... Going into uh, Mark and also Matthew, and you're going to look here and you'll see all these notations. I'm not going to keep talking about which book it's coming out of because, as I've said, we're going to be jumping. If you're trying to follow in your Bible, you're going to be jumping all over the place. And that's why we, we recommend the workbook or to download onto an iPad or something to there uh, about this. Uh, as we open up here, it says, and is the beginning of, of Mark's, and then is the beginning of Matthew. One says and, one says then. Both means pretty much the same. It came to pass in those days, that is the days of the preaching of John the Baptist, that Jesus came, come from Nazareth of Galilee, to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And so we have Jesus who has been up in the area of Nazareth and he has lived there, worked there, is known there, attends synagogue there. And so he is Jesus of Nazareth. That's what People will know him as he is uh, from there, but uh, that is to the north. And John starts his ministry down in the area of Judea, especially uh, between Jericho and the Jordan River, preaching there in the wilderness area. 
And so Jesus comes down from uh, Nazareth at the appropriate time to be baptized of John. And so this begins a period of time where both John and Jesus will be preaching and teaching. Jesus will be uh, calling disciples to himself. John will still continue to make disciples, encouraging them to uh, also embrace Jesus when and the Messiah when he comes. John will, as we'll see, point some of his disciples uh, to Jesus, introduce them to him. Uh, and so they, uh, at uh, the Holy Spirit, directed John when to begin. God instructed him when to begin his teaching. And as we said last week, if we take into consideration that John was about six months older than Jesus, uh, and again, it's just a guess, but uh, we would guess that John had about a six-month head start. And then as Jesus uh, was of the age of about 30, as it says. Then he came down to join himself with John. You know, there there is some, lots of questions, you know, why, you know, if Jesus didn't have any sins to confess, you know, why did he have to be baptized of John? Well, if he wasn't baptized of John, one of the answers is it would appear as if they were doing two different things. It would appear as though Jesus was doing his thing and John was doing... Jesus could have started in Nazareth and Galilee. He could have started preaching to the people that he knew and knew him. And he could have started ministry there. And then somebody would hear, well, there's another guy down in Judea who's preaching down there. And so Jesus would have been preaching in the north and John would be preaching in the South, and it would appear as though they were two different uh, movements, if you want to call it that, two different uh, groups. Now, while you know they, uh, while in this time where it overlaps, they're actually working together. Now, some of John's disciples may not necessarily see it that way. Uh, they're going to uh, want, you know, they've been following John, listening to John. They're John's disciples and so you know it's it's going to be a, a little difficult for them to turn loose of John and embrace Jesus uh, and eventually you know John is going to be beheaded that pretty much puts an end to the uh, you know Jesus and John which one Jesus well John's gone you know John's gone it's not funny but you know John's gone so uh, you know, you're, if you have to, now's the time to, if you haven't, to, you know, join with Jesus and in his ministry. And so Jesus honors John and John's work. He comes down there where John is preaching, and he doesn't come in some way as to assert any authority uh, over John, and at least at the start, in the sense of, you know, patting him on the shoulder and say, "I'll take over from here." You know, it's it's not really one of those situations. The two of them will work for a period of time uh, together, still preaching and teaching about uh, the coming of the kingdom. And so he comes there unto John to be baptized of him. And we're told that he was baptized of John, but John would have hindered him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? But Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And we're told then he suffered him, uh, and so once he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit uh, into the wilderness. And we'll get into some of that a little later as our time is, is running out here this evening. But it's, it's understanding 
there, there is an understanding here that, you know, John, in his way of looking at things, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie his shoe latches, shoe laces. I'm not worthy to even carry his shoes, be the servant who, who brings them or takes them. Uh, and so that's the mindset that John had. Uh, John didn't seem to have a problem understanding he wasn't going to be uh, the Messiah. Now, I don't know how much he knew about what was going to happen in the future, but through the revelations that the Spirit made to John, John understood that his preaching and teaching was a way of preparing and that Jesus must increase and he would decrease. And so as he appears before John, the logical thing with his attitude is, you know, uh, I don't think that's kind of the way we ought to be doing this. I think, you know, I need to be baptized of you if you're going to start this you know, I've, I've made things ready for you. And so now if you're going to start, then I need you to baptize me. And what he basically was saying is, I need you to take me and all the others in as your disciples. That's what he was, that's really what he's talking about. It's, it's not that he didn't again want to baptize him at all. But the idea is, is, you know, things are kind of backwards. You know, if I baptize you, then that makes you a disciple of me. That's kind of the way he's thinking. And, and that's kind of backwards. You need to, that's what he's saying. I have need to be baptized of you. That would make me then a disciple of yours. That's what he's saying. It's, it's not really about who needs the forgiveness of sins or don't need the forgiveness of sins. It's not what we're dealing with here. Uh, and that's what John is, is trying to get a hold of in his head, that he who does the baptizing is the one who's making the disciples. And he has been making disciples for six months or so. And they're John's disciples. All of these people are his disciples. And so if, again, John is baptized of Jesus, then it's easy for all of them to then become the disciples of of Jesus. John was bring all of his people under the umbrella of the ministry of Jesus. But that's not, uh, it's, it's interesting, but that's just not the way God wanted to do it at that time. He still intended to use John to prepare, and he intended to use Jesus to prepare. And so, you know, the two of them were going to kind of work side by side for a while uh, in still preparing people until, uh, you know, we get off and running. And, uh, you know, we, we can look at that as we, we go along. But eventually John will literally decrease and Jesus will most certainly increase. And so, uh, you know, it... In fulfilling all righteousness, you know, to fulfill the requirements and what was going on at the particular time, uh, Jesus submitted to the baptism of John, and therefore by his submitting to the baptism of John, those who had already been baptized of John did not, at least at that point, see Jesus as a threat. Uh, that Jesus had come here, he's going to take away everything. We, we see a little bit of that, you know, you know, the one that you baptize, you know, he's out there preaching and teaching and people are following him. There is a little jealousy that shows up. We'll see uh, as we get into this. But for right now, you know, this is God's plan. This is the way it needs to work. And so you need to uh, accept that for now. Uh, you know, you, you need to permit, you know, this, this moment, uh, you know, and, and let these things happen as God has planned. And then we will go from there. And of course, Jesus is going to be still led into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. He's going to come back out and start his, his ministry. And, and so 
And while Jesus is there, those 40 days in the wilderness, John is still preaching and teaching and doing what he did as Jesus is preparing himself to start his earthly ministry. Any questions or comments? Second John 9 version. It says, Whosoever transgressed abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he that both the Father and the Son, if there comes any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. What are you saying? The house of the church? Well, again, you know, the church met in people's houses. And so when they were looking for the church, most of the time they were meeting in someone's home. And when somebody just like the Apostle Paul would come into a city, uh, John would come into a city, anyone would come in there, they would start making inquiries about, you know, the church. Does a church meet here? Is there... Uh, a place where it meets. And so the actual concept of a church building really didn't come along until many years later. And so, uh, yeah, so the, they met in somebody's house. And, you know, if a new preacher come into town wanting to join with the church, and you start asking questions and the things that he's teaching don't quite seem to match up with the doctrine of Christ, then, you know, John says, don't, don't let him into your house. Don't invite him in. Don't stand him up in front of the congregation Sunday morning and let him preach those false teachings. And, you know, when, and by prohibiting him from coming into the house, you know, you're, you're again, protecting the church, uh, but he also says, don't bid him Godspeed. Don't say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, you seem to be teaching false doctrine, but good luck. I hope God blesses you along the way. You know, John said, don't even, don't, don't encourage him. You know, you know, I hate to say slam a door in his face, not necessarily saying that, but, you know, he's not getting in across the threshold. That's what John says. Don't even let him in your house. Don't bid them Godspeed. Don't encourage them uh, in the things that they're doing. Because if you do that, if you say, well, you know, I, I see we, we're at odds, but why don't you come in and have, you know, dinner and you can spend the night. Then next thing you know, you know, they're preaching and teaching and talking to others. And so, yeah, so, you know, we want to discourage false teachers uh, at all times. Thank you again for listening to the lessons today. We would encourage you to visit our website. For more learning opportunities, there is much to do and see. www.thechurchesofchrist.life May God bless you. Until we have time together again.